We're sitting at the intertidal at Northeastern University's Marine Science Center in Naha, just north of Boston. You see the city of Boston behind me, and right next to us is, is a natural New England intertidal ecosystem. What's really unusual about this facility is, is a proximity to a major urban center. Um, the environment is changing so rapidly that almost no place on Earth is untouched by humans. So a lot of what we study here is the interaction between the natural and the human environments, really a coupled human natural ecosystem. So this is really an ideal place for us to look at how things like climate change impact ecosystems on which humans depend. Um, behind me right now, it's early morning, things are pretty cool, it's a low tide, uh, the animals and plants are all doing pretty well, but if we came out here on a sunny day, things would be completely different, and that's a lot of what we study in my lab. We want to understand how climate change interacts with other stressors to affect organisms, ecosystems, things that re humans really care about. Scientifically, environments like coastal zones are incredibly interesting, they're also culturally very important. This is where babies of fish we care about live. This is where we have coastal erosion happening. This is our first line of defense against hurricanes. Um, this is really the interface between the human and natural worlds in terms of the ocean. So we intensively study the nearshore environment. We especially look at the intertidal zone. That's the region between the low and the high tide lines. So these animals and plants are really exposed to both the terrestrial and the aquatic environments on a daily basis. So if you can imagine um, being on a sunny beach, sitting there um, with a nice drink in your hand in a bathing suit, and then all of a sudden you are submerged in Antarctic water where you're gonna have to hold your breath for the next eight hours and do all those other things that you care about. You're gonna have to feed, you're gonna have to uh, reproduce, you're gonna have to, to eat other organisms. That's really what these organisms have to do on a daily basis. They have to survive the terrestrial environment in air, then they have to go back in the cold water environment and undergo these rapid changes. So you might think that because they're exposed to these, these incredibly dynamic conditions, they might be sort of buffered against environmental change. What we're finding out is that's not the case, that they really are living very close to their edge. So what we're looking at is the intertidal zone as a sort of bellwether, canary in the coal mine for a lot of what we're seeing with climate change. And in fact, we are seeing some incredible changes out here. The intertidal animals and seaweeds really um, get a raw deal out here. I mean, during the summertime, during a low tide in the middle of the day when the sun is out, um, they can really heat up. They can get to over 40 degrees Celsius. So if you can imagine putting your hand in a parking lot on a hot sunny day and feeling just how warm that is, how much warmer that is in air temperature, that's really what a lot of these plants and algae are experiencing out here. In contrast, if you come out here in the winter time and you have a low tide in the middle of the night, they're absolutely freezing, and in some cases literally freezing, um, because they're exposed to that really cold air in the middle of the night, and so they're losing all their body heat. So seasonally, we see these incredible temperature changes, and these incredible changes in things like salinity, and now with ocean acidification, these incredible changes in pH in this coastal environment, which gives us access to a really rich ecosystem to study um, in terms of our science questions. So there's a rich diversity of organisms out here. You see behind me birds, there are cormorants sitting over the rock over there. They depend on what happens in the intertidal zone. We have invertebrates like mussels and barnacles that are covering the rocks, um, but have changed in recent years. I did my master's degree out here about 20 years ago. When I was here, there was a mussel bed that extended for almost an acre nearby here. It's completely gone now. Um, there are a number of algae. There are things like uh, fucus is one of the seaweeds we see here that's very common in the rock, or ascophyllum that we see draping over the side like Medusa's hair. Um, these are also being affected by climate change, but we don't yet know how, and especially we don't understand exactly how climatic factors interact with things like nutrient stress, things like changes in pH, things like um, sediment runoff. How do these things impact the organisms that not only drive the ecosystem, but also affect humans? So for example, um, when a storm comes in, uh, we have marshes as our first line of defense. Marshes absorb a huge amount of the water coming in. They also serve as nurseries for a lot of the species we care about, a lot of commercial species. Um, when those go, their ecosystem services, the things they do for humans go. Um, we want to understand how can that be prevented, and in order to do that, we have to understand how these ecosystems function, not in a pristine environment, but in an environment where they are interacting with humans.
This morning, Kelsey's measuring respiration rates of a common intertidal snail litteria. This is part of an international collaboration that we're working on, in this case with Hong Kong, where we're trying to develop a common protocol for exploring how climate change impacts common intertidal organisms. So we do things like measure heartbeat rates, measure respiration rates in common organisms. Um, we then share those techniques across the network. Uh, Kelsey will be on her way to Hong Kong in a few weeks uh, to do these same methods on intertidal organisms there as well. Um, part of what we're interested in are the cumulative effects of all these stressors that result from climate change and non-climatic factors. What she's studying today is what happens with these heat waves, what happens when we have extreme temperatures, but we're also interested um, what happens to things like reproduction and growth where we have slightly elevated temperatures over longer periods of time. My name is Jessica Tarosian. I am a second year grad student in Brian Helmut's lab, and I'm trying to understand how seasonal variation in different stressors impacts muscle reproduction. Muscle populations in Massachusetts and the rest of the Gulf of Maine have been declining recently, um, but we don't know what's causing that. Um, if it's reduced um, reproduction from a single population, or if it's just sort of lots of populations have been decreasing in size and there's lower recruitment of new individuals into a population. So hopefully this will help shed some light on what's going on. So when the muscles opened up, this is actually where they release their byssus threads from, which is what attaches them to rocks. Uh, this piece right here um, is the gill. Um, so they will filter water through and their food gets stuck on the gill. And then inside here is what we call the mantle tissue, and that's actually where most of the reproductive tissue is. So um, this here is either sperm or egg, depending on whether or not it's male or female. Um, and muscles are broadcast spawners, so what they do is they release sperm and egg into the water column, and that's where they're fertilized. So to measure the number of offspring they produce, I have to measure the gonad tissue relative to the body tissue, and that tells me when they're reproducing and how many babies they're producing. Because these organisms are exposed to sunlight and wind speed and they don't actually regulate their own body temperature like we do, the temperatures that their bodies experience are very, very different and it can depend on their size, their color, and their shape. So you could have two organisms of the same species that are right next to each other on the rock, but if one's maybe a little bit smaller and a little darker in color, it can experience a very, very different temperature than the one that's next to it. Um, so because these guys are black, they absorb the sun, and it's really, really important that we actually know what they're experiencing as opposed to what the logger color and shape would experience unmodified. Instead of just putting out a regular thermometer at all of our sites, what we actually do is we modify the temperature loggers that we put out. So we use loggers so that we don't have to go out there every day ourselves. It actually is like a little computer and it records temperature. Um, these are the temperature sensors that we use. Um, this is called an eye button. Um, and it fits nicely inside a middleless, edgeless blue muscle shell. Um, and this is called a uh, tidbit logger. And this is embedded in resin and we use these for looking at muscle temperatures on the west coast. Most of my sites are in very urban um, or active um, harbors, so it's really interesting to see how these mussels are actually thriving in areas where there's a lot of human traffic. Um, I'm looking at how body temperature as well as um, food availability, so chlorophyll levels and salinity um, impact uh, the number of eggs that these mussels produce. In our lab, we have chambers like these ones called environmental chambers, we're able to completely mimic what the air temperature is like outside within these chambers. We can change the interval of how quickly air temperature will rise or air temperature will fall within a long period of time to understand what the heartbeat is like for an animal during that time of stress. Here, Anthony is doing heartbeat sensing experiments inside the chambers. In the Northeast, we've lost about 99% of our oysters um, and in many of these soft sediment bottoms, there's not a whole lot of structure. So I'm putting out um, these oyster, uh, we call them oyster pizzas. They're basically oysters that have been set in cement. Um, and we're hoping that this will provide um, a settlement structure for, for those larvae and also habitat for a number of fish and crab species that might utilize them. Um, and we're also going to have some ones that are within cages uh, to prevent predation by the number, a number of species, but uh, most importantly, the number of invasive crabs we have, so green crabs and Asian shore crabs, uh, hopefully to get an idea of 
what effect these invasive crabs have on early life history oysters. Um, so the hope is basically to be able to find out what is influencing them, uh, the success and reef evolution of oysters in the Northeast uh, for the hope that it'll help with future restoration efforts, which uh, we really need up here. So climate change, by definition, is something that's happening on a global scale, and so we do use these very large data sets like satellite data. Uh, we're funded by NASA right now, so we use satellite products to look at how things like temperature or salinity change over these very large scales. But one of the important things about climate change is that how it impacts organisms plays out on a very local level. Um, so we use a series of sensors at very small scales and then connect that with these very large scale data sets that we get th from things like buoys and satellites. Here we have some localized data that we use to ground truth with the satellite data. And we have some robot muscles here that we developed that biomimics uh, body temperature of real live actual muscles. So here we have some data from California showing from November 2013 to November 2014. And we have temperature, our biomimic tem body temperature data ranging from zero degrees Celsius to all the way up to 40 degrees Celsius. So animals in the intertidal are experiencing extreme heat and extreme cold temperature in an annual basis. These localized sensors, like these robo-muscle sensors, are important to our studies because they provide information like temperature ranges that we can't get from large scales temperature like from buoy data and from satellite data. Not only are we interested in large, large data like data from satellite, data from buoy out in the ocean, our lab also interested in local data like weather data and what's going on in the local environment. So here at the MSC we deployed a uh, weather station out here uh, by the cliffs and this will get really localized data of what's going on in the environment, how, how air temperature are um, affecting mussels and shellfish and other economical important animals out in the intertidal. And that the weather station also serves as a good communications with the locals living here in Naha as well as they use it for boating uh, activities and water activities as well. Our ultimate goal is to try to forecast where problem spots are likely to rise as a result of climate change and other stressors in these coastal ecosystems. So we have a series of what we call biophysical models. It basically keeps track of heat entering and leaving an animal's body. Um, so we take data from the weather station that um, we have out here at the Marine Lab. We take data from satellites. And we put these into computer models that we can then compare against these small-scale measurements we make using biomimic models. So what we're seeing here um, are model results. These are model body temperatures um, that we have generated using environmental data. We can compare those against what we actually measure in the field. Um, we can then compare those against um, physiological data. Um, an important point, again, is that air temperature really isn't a very good predictor of what we're seeing in the field. So in red, what we're seeing is air temperature. The highest it gets is about 30 degrees. Um, but we see body temperatures that are getting up to an amazing 50, 55 degrees Celsius. So these animals are really, really baking in the sun. Um, and that's not something we can pick up with air temperature. The only way we can get that is with these biophysical models and these biomimic sensors in the field. The work we do is on a truly international scale, and that has culminated in a group we call Inshore. Uh, Inshore has brought together scientists from around the world. Um, if we look at the, the map of participants, you can see um, where we've reached, the people we're working with. Um, in a couple of cases, these are in um, countries that are still developing their scientific program, like Iraq. Um, it brings together scientists with a common cause, and so we're developing common protocols. Um, common techniques for looking at the effects of climate change on coastal ecosystems and finding common solutions. So there are diversity of ideas, opinions, and problems facing the world. Um, how do we bring those to bear at a very local scale? Um, part of that is that uh, we have teamed together to try to educate the publics around the world. So we have a series of virtual tours from every place we work. Um, again, you can see that the map of the sites where we have tours. Um, we have everything from underwater video tours um, to virtual tours above land um, that people can play with. So this is a shot underwater outside the Aquarius habitat with a project we did with Fabian Cousteau called Mission 31 last summer that shows us working underwater. Um, we have tours like this from places that are really difficult to get to. So just as one example, this is a virtual tour of a site in Israel. Um, looking north towards Le Lebanon. 
Um, the amazing thing about this is that we can really zoom into a very close scale. So if you can imagine a student who wants to get a sense of what the inner tunnel is like in another part of the world, she can go to one of these virtual tours and get down to the level of a barnacle, try to really experience that and get a sense of what it's like to be in that region. So we have virtual reality glasses, we have tours online, and the goal of this is to try to transport people to the places around the world where we work. So places that are really hard to get to, like Iraq. Um, this on the screen right now is, is the border of Iraq and Iran. Um, it used to be a salt marsh, um, but it is still somebody's backyard. And so if we can get the point across that every place in the world is somebody's backyard, that will start to make these connections on a global scale. The kind of work we do, especially on an international basis, is often really difficult to fund. Funding is really hard to get right now as a scientist, especially for anything that's long term. Uh, most funding from the federal government is almost like a presidential cycle. It's on a three or four year basis. But the problems we're studying often take decades, and especially the training aspect. You can't train a student in two or three years, which makes it very difficult to start connecting the dots. So essentially, we end up cobbling together funding from different sources. So far, we've been very fortunate. We've gotten funding from NASA, from the National Science Foundation, from NOAA. Um, but it's getting harder and harder to do this kind of work. And that's really one of the major limitations we have right now for how we can explore the impacts of climate change is the funding we can get to study the ecosystems.